Are you ready to overcome the complexities and burdens that come with your success? Join the team at Centura Wealth Advisory in the Live Life Liberated podcast. Now, on to the show. Hello and welcome to Live Life Liberated with the team from Centura Wealth Advisory. Today, Dana Levin is on the mic and this is her first time hosting the podcast. I'm super excited. Dana, thank you so much for being on the show. Thanks so much for having me, Eric. Really appreciate it. Well, this is your show. You're having me here. So I should say say it that way, but this is your first time. And Dana, since this is your first time hosting, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and what your role is at Centura? Sure, I'd be pleased to. So for the last 15 years, I was a fundraiser for a variety of nonprofit organizations, and most recently the last seven years for a large social service agency here in San Diego. And last summer, I received a call from Derek Myron, who many of our listeners know as Centura's managing director, and he called to discuss a donation that one of his clients wanted to consider making to my organization. And Mm. it sparked an ongoing conversation around the many ways we could partner. And soon thereafter, Derek called me to ask asked me to join the Centura team to focus on new business development in the nonprofit space. And I'm proud to be focused on reinforcing Centura's commitment to working with the nonprofit organizations in, in partnership and supporting clients' aspirations to give back to the community now and in the future. Oh, that is fantastic. Yeah, it sounds like you're a great fit for the team starting to take over the podcast. And being that this is your first one, you've already got a guest on the show. Who did you bring on? I did. I brought Senior Vice President of the Eisenhower Health Foundation, Wendy Bierbauer. Oh, fantastic. I'm so excited to hear from you guys today. Yes, we're certainly excited to be here. And I know so many of our listeners own real estate and may own multiple homes. And today we're going to discuss some of the ways to utilize these aspects to support philanthropy in the community. So really excited for this conversation. So Wendy, I'd love to uh, just do a quick intro and, uh, and then let you share all of the uh, interesting things that you have to tell us for today. Wendy is the Senior Vice President of the Eisenhower Health Foundation, where she has been making an impact at the hospital for the past four and a half years. She has an incredibly interesting background, holding a real estate license since 2007 and having worked in real estate at Caldwell Banker and then in the fintech space and financing with Equity Key. In both real estate and nonprofit, you know, you you have to love to build relationships. And Wendy, you do this so magnificently and encourage donors to consider using real estate to build a legacy through the Eisenhower Health Foundation. And you're an expert in creative charitable planning and leveraging real estate while also building deep relationships with donors. And I'm so pleased to be in conversation with you today. Thank you, Dana. It's really great to be here. And, and it's certainly an exciting time to be talking about real estate. Most definitely. So, so Wendy, first, t- tell us a little bit about the Eisenhower Health Foundation, and then I'm curious about how you incorporate real estate into your fundraising, which is interesting for a nonprofit organization. Sure, absolutely. So Eisenhower Health is is a hospital system based in Rancho Mirage, California. We are the only not-for-profit hospital in the Coachella Valley and uh, celebrating our 50th anniversary this year. So it's a, it's a great time to be at Eisenhower. We have a very unique payer mix out here in the desert in that 70% of our patients are Medicare patients because of the demographics of retirees out here. And about 10% on top of that are Medi-Cal patients. And so I often laugh and say we make half as much money on twice as many patients as a typical hospital. <laughs> so we, we relied uh, greatly on the generosity of our donors to keep this a fantastic hospital. And we're a five-star rated hospital by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid. We're one of the top 50 cardiology hospitals in the country, a leader in joint replacements, of course, because of our demographic as well, and our brand new Eisenhower Desert Orthopedic uh, Center. So wow. it's, it's a fantastic hospital made so only because of philanthropy and the generosity of our donors. And so it, it's, it's exciting to uh, be able to share with our donors a lot of different ways that they can support the hospital. In, may, in many cases, ways that they didn't think of. And, and certainly, gifts of real estate or other highly appreciated assets are fantastic ways to to make charitable donations, avoid capital gains tax, and we'll talk more about that, reduce their tax liability. If they need to create a lifetime income stream, we can do that, as well as just providing life simplification. So we'll go through all of those benefits as we talk about each of these items in more detail, but it's, it's, a, it's a great time to to be considering highly appreciated assets, especially with a potential increase in, in capital gains tax. 
Certainly, certainly. And and tell us a little bit about the unique real estate environment in the desert. You know, how, how does it differ from other markets potentially? Well, it, like in most markets, it's it's on fire out here. Housing prices in Palm Springs, Rancho Mirage, and Indian Wells were up more than 30% over last year. So that's wow. a pretty in- incredible increase. And while it's a, it's a mixed blessing, obviously that's a fantastic thing to be happening in a marketplace, but it certainly exacerbates any issues with capital gains tax if someone is getting ready to sell. The other thing that's really unique in this market is that many of the homes here are second and third homes for people, vacation homes. These are not necessarily, in many cases, the the long-term primary family home where maybe you raised your kids and, and that kind of thing, where there's an emotional attachment to a home. Out here, it's more vacation homes, places that people come for several months. And so it's it's a little bit easier to talk to people about making gifts of real estate because there's not the same amount of uh, emotional attachment. Additionally, in your second and third vacation home, the owners don't have the primary residence deduction from capital gains that they often have from their from their home, as we say, back home. Um, <laughs> So great asset to use for charitable giving. People often don't think about using real estate for charitable giving. So we have conversations with people about, you know, do your children want to have this home long term? And in most cases, when we talk to people out here, they say either they don't want the home, they don't know if the children want the home. But in most cases, their children are doing something in other markets. And so, again, it makes it easy to use real estate here as charitable giving. The other nice thing about using real estate for charitable giving is it removes it from the estate. So there's no estate tax issue with that real estate uh, once they've passed. So it's just some really great ways to uh, to use that. Certainly. I mean, those all sound sound like the upsides for sure and a great opportunity to be able to use it for good to give back into the community. So why why do you think somebody would potentially sell their, their second home or their vacation home at this point, Wendy? Well, our, our average donor is, is 74 years old. And so we're seeing, you know, either people are thinking about moving back closer to their children as they get older, they're downsizing, or in some cases, uh, we have donors who, who pass away here, you know, while they're living here in the desert. And so their families have to make decisions about selling selling that real estate. Certainly, certainly. And are you finding, especially with COVID, that as donors age and, you know, we live in the interesting world that we live in right now with COVID, are, mm. are people traveling, you know, so much less? And so are you finding that people are even more willing to consider this this type of donation structure? Absolutely. Again, in many cases, what's happening is people are moving here to the desert because they're they're simplifying their life. So maybe they had three or four homes around the the world or country, and instead they're simplifying, and maybe they now have one home somewhere and a vacation home here in the desert, and that's it. And so we're also seeing a lot of people who are choosing to move here to the desert who are now able to work from home. And they mm. would prefer to live here than maybe in Los Angeles or San Francisco where they used to live. But because they can work from home now, they're choosing to live here in the desert. So um, yeah, it has really a lot of um, sense. It made a huge difference in our real estate market here in a big way. Sure, sure. No, that, that certainly all adds up. And as, as donors age and travel less, what are the options beyond just an outright traditional sale? So there, there are several different ways that that we're using real estate for for planned giving and even current giving, and those three ways are a, a gift and sale of real estate, and we'll talk more about each of these as we go, a charitable remainder trust from the sale of real estate, or even a retained life estate, and each of those are, are fairly simple ways to maximize the sale and or use charitable use of real estate and all ways that we can help people. But what's most important, Dana, is that if people are thinking about making a sale of a highly appreciated asset, specifically real estate, but in, in in every case, a highly appreciated asset, they need to talk to the charitable organizations that they want to support before they sell. They need to talk to their financial advisor before they sell. Because once they've sold, the, the options are, are <laughs> dramatically limited. Too late. In how we can, it's too late to, to avoid the capital gains. So if you're thinking about making a sale, please talk to someone before you do that. And and there are a lot of great ways that we can uh, help to structure a gift and avoid capital gains. 
Excellent. I certainly hope that people have those conversations with their favorite nonprofit organization because it's certainly a good option. But like you said, uh, once once you uh, move things forward too far too fast, it limits the opportunities. So for a, a gift or sale of real estate, a donor donates the home outright and gets a charitable deduction, correct? And are there key points that our, our listeners should know when gifting real estate directly to a nonprofit organization? Absolutely. So I'll give you two examples, one where a a donor gifted a condominium outright and then one where a different donor gifted a portion of of the home. And and in both cases, the donor's getting ready to sell a property. So let's go with the the full gift. We have a donor who has a $400,000 condo here in Palm Springs that he was using as a rental property. He bought it for $100,000 back when the market crashed. And he's fully depreciated the condo. He's getting ready to sell it tired of being a landlord. And because it's in a high market, he thought, hey, this is a great time. But then he started looking at all the capital gains he was going to owe if he did sell it and realized that if he gifted the condo outright to Eisenhower, he got a huge tax deduction that he got completely able to walk away, just handed us the keys and said, this is your problem now. He didn't have to pay any of the of the uh closing costs, none of the commissions. He just got a huge tax deduction and realized that he probably net out about the same thing in tax savings as he would have if he had sold the property. And he has none of the headaches of doing that. And he got to benefit a charity that he really cares about. So that's one great way to to, to do it. And, and talk about life simplification. He handed over the keys and walked away. So hmm. wow, that sounds great like a great, a great setup. <laughs> And it was a wonderful gift to, to the hospital. So, But then there are also people who gift a portion of their property. And again, it's so important to do this before you put the house on the market and before you accept an offer. It's got to be done before. But if you're trying to avoid capital gains, if you gift a portion of your home, and most charities can tell you what portion of the home you would need to gift to offset the capital gains you're going to incur, that transfer happens before the home is sold. The tax deduction happens and you avoid the, the gain. So let me give you an example. We had a, a donor who had a million-dollar home with a cost basis of 300000 So they were going to incur about $184,000 in capital gains if they just sold the house outright. Instead, they donated 25% interest in the property before they put the house on the market. So they donated 25% interest in the property to Eisenhower. They created an immediate $250,000 tax deduction. Now, remember, it's based on the appraised value of the home, not the sale price of the home. So appraisals are very high because there's lots and lots of great comps right now. So it's a great way to do that. And you don't have to wait until the home sells to get the tax deduction. So it's great. Mm, That's Uh, a great great arrangement. Right. So this donor received an immediate $250,000 tax deduction. They saved nearly $61,000 in capital gains tax and $116,000 in income tax. So they saved almost $180,000 in taxes, offsetting almost all of the capital gains. So they, they took money out of Uncle Sam's pocket and instead supported the charity that they cared most about. So it was just a great way to do it. They were thrilled that they were able to offset those capital gains tax while supporting their charity. And so just, it worked out great. Certainly. I mean, I can imagine so many of our listeners would love to move their tax liability bucket, so to speak, over to their charitable bucket and to be able to make that kind of impact in the community. So it sounds like a wonderful way to do it as well. Absolutely. And it was very simple. Sure. And and that's and that's key too. Obviously we want to make it as easy for everybody as possible. And it sounds like you have the the tools to be able to make that happen. So everybody loves something that's even easier and of course, you know, doing good in the community so much better than paying the taxes. So in previous podcast episodes, we've covered charitable lead annuity trust or CLATS, and we've set many of them up each year for our clients. And often this will be a wrapper around their investment real estate. Wendy, can you explain a little bit about a charitable remainder trust or a CRUT and how you're seeing those being set up with investment real estate? Sure. So a charitable remainder trust is basically the opposite of a of a CLAT. And that means that the asset that's in the charitable remainder trust pays income to the donor, not the charity. So it pays income to the donor for life or for a term of years, whichever the donor chooses. And at the end of that term or at the end of life, the remainder interest that's in that trust goes to the charity. 
one of the ways that this can be used for real estate is particularly if someone has, I'll give you an example of, we had a donor who had a highly appreciated real estate in Long Beach, California. Fantastic hot market right now. They bought this home 30 years ago. <laughs> so you mm-hmm. can imagine how much that property has appreciated during that that time frame. It's been a rental property for most of those 30 years. So they've depreciated the entire property. They're going to have huge capital gains tax if they sell this property. So they're tired of being landlords. They're both in their 70s. They just want to simplify life. But they have this huge capital gains problem. So they came to us and said, you know, what what can we do? So what we helped this donor to do was they gifted that property into a charitable remainder trust. And we paid to and, and helped them set that charitable remainder trust up. They put the property in there and then the trust sells the property. Okay, The trust sells the property because the charitable remainder trust does not incur capital gains. It's a charitable trust. Okay, So they avoided the capital gains on that. Mm-hmm. Then the donor also chose a percentage payout that they would receive from that trust. So the trust then reinvests the assets that are in that after the home sells with their favorite financial advisor or whomever they choose to invest those, those proceeds in the trust. And the donor receives a payout. They choose the percentage payout. It's typically between 5 and 9% that the, that the donor will choose to receive each year. But in this case, the donor chose an amount that equals the rentals that they were receiving from that property. So they are still receiving the same amount of income that they were receiving from that rental property, but they now no longer have any of the headaches. They got a huge tax deduction, and life is simple for them. And now when they're gone, that uh, remainder in the trust then would come to Eisenhower or their favorite charity to to benefit the charity. So it was just a, a perfect solution for them. And they were so thrilled that, the again, the more money went to the charity instead of more money going to capital gains. So that was a, a perfect solution for them. Now, you've probably got a lot of listeners who have been 1031-ing properties over and over and over again, and they're tired of doing that, and they're tired of the pressure of that, this is also a great way to do that. It put that property into a charitable remainder trust instead of a 1031 and get the benefits of avoiding capital gains that way. We're also seeing a lot of folks that who have elderly parents who are thinking about selling their home to either move into something smaller, move into assisted living, and they could really use that that guaranteed lifetime income. Sure. And so again, put that property into a charitable remainder trust to pay out a lifetime income to those to your parents. So it's a great way to do it. Yeah, that that certainly sounds like a home run also. So, Wendy, for the first two examples, they involve selling the home. But if someone who lives in the desert full time and, you know, they don't want to sell their home, what do you recommend for them? Is there a is there a way for them to get a tax deduction today based on the future gift? Yeah, we're doing a lot of 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 retained life estates with donors. You either hear retained life estate or life estate reserved. It's the same same thing, but it's such a neat way to to benefit a charity and get a get a benefit for the donor. In a retained life estate, the donor prepares a deed from the owner to the charity. Okay, so they're deeding the home to the charity, but they're reserving a right to use the property for their lifetime. So nothing changes for them. They can still remodel paint. They still have to maintain the property. They still have to pay property taxes. In fact, they sign a maintenance insurance and tax agreement with the charity saying they're going to continue to maintain uh, the property, pay for insurance, pay for taxes while they continue to uh, live in and, and enjoy the property. But because they've made this gift irrevocable to the charity, they get an immediate tax deduction based on the appraised value of the home. So again, home run today, while property uh, values are so high, they get the tax deduction based on the property value as appraised and their age. So the combination of those two determines what the tax deduction is, but uh, suffice it to say a very large tax deduction. And then total life simplification because when they no longer live in the home, for whatever reason, either they just are done, they move back closer to family and they don't want to mess with it anymore, or they pass away, then that home immediately reverts to the charity that they've chosen. And it's the charity's responsibility now to get that home sold. So that's how the charity receives their gift is once the home is sold, that uh, those proceeds go to the charity. So that homeowner no longer has to burden 
anybody with getting a home sold. And we're seeing, again, because many of these are second homes, the children are in New York and the home is here in Rancho Mirage. And these people say, we're so relieved that our children aren't going to have to leave their lives to come here and manage getting this home sold at some point in the future. But instead, it's just going to benefit Eisenhower. So I'll give you a good example. We have a 78-year-old widow who lives in a $1.1 million home here. And her children are not here locally. They come to visit her, but they do not have an interest in in owning that home after she's gone. She received an $818,000 tax deduction, which, of course, she can use up over six years. And there is no change in her cash flow, no change in her living arrangement. Nothing's changed for her, except she gets this massive tax deduction and knows that in the future, when she's no longer living in that home, Eisenhower is going to get a huge benefit in, in receiving that home as a, as a beautiful gift and no burden on her heirs. It's just a great way to do it, particularly if you know someone is planning to leave a home to a charity anyway, they might as well get the tax deduction while they're alive and get the, the thanks from the charity for, for knowing that that gift is coming. Certainly. Wow. That also sounds like a great arrangement. And and like you said, you know, nothing really changes for them in the short term in terms of, you know, their day-to-day living, the bill pay, the maintenance, all of those things just remain unchanged. It's only really what happens at the end of the, either their lifetime or like you said, when they're done with the home that, you know, it gets to come back and, and benefit the hospital, which is phenomenal. So it's another really interesting way to to structure it. Is that, a, is that a popular thing for people to be doing these days? Do you see that often versus the other two examples of, of selling the home? It's certainly popular when we educate people that this is available to them because they love the idea of getting a huge tax deduction now without having to part with anything. It, it's it's fantastic way. And as soon as we explain to them that nothing changes for them in terms of their ability to enjoy the home and and, uh, and do whatever they want to with the home, but they get that huge tax deduction now, it's it's very popular. You'll let them paint the walls pink and put up the stripey wallpaper as they wish, huh? <laughs> sure. <laughs> it's their home. Right, right. That's wonderful. Wonderful. That's that's very helpful and interesting to learn about that solution also. Pivoting just a little bit, so we have a lot of nonprofit professionals who also listen to our podcast. How do you recommend that they bring up conversations around giving real estate as part of an annual campaign or a planned gift with the donors in their organization? It's a great question. I, I think it's most important to just continue to reinforce with your donors that they talk to you before they make a sale of a highly appreciated asset. You have to keep reminding them of that so that they're really thinking about it automatically. When, but right before they get to sell something, they think, oh, wait a minute, Wendy told me I, I should probably run this buyer just because they may be able to help me save on taxes. So you've got to keep that conversation going with your donor. But I think the most the most important thing is just to really understand what their needs are. Ask about their family. Do they have real estate that the family doesn't want? In our case at Eisenhower, we're willing to accept gifts of real estate that are not necessarily here in the desert. So they may have a vacation home up in Lake Tahoe as well, something like that that they that they uh, want to consider. So, but but it takes you've got to have conversations about what. What kind of real estate do they have? Does their family want the real estate? Does their family come here and enjoy the desert? Do they have rental properties? And are they tired of being landlords? As I as I used as an example, that's a great question to ask somebody is, aren't you tired of being a landlord right now? And then most importantly, find out if they'd like to take advantage of this peak market without, without capital gains. Uh, if I think given the choice, there are a lot of people who would like to take advantage of these really high prices, but they... They aren't comfortable doing it because of the capital gains that they would incur. And again, um, we may see capital gains going up, you know, significantly here in the in the near future, which makes this an even more important conversation to have with people. But I would just make sure that your folks know that no matter what the asset is, don't assume that your donors understand that they can avoid capital gains. I mean, I still have CEOs of large companies who make gifts in cash. And I just, I don't understand that. I mean, it's just, they can donate appreciated stock, they can donate appreciated uh, real estate and avoid significant capital gains. But sometimes they just aren't thinking about that. They aren't thinking like that. And so it's our job to make sure that they understand the benefits of that. Certainly. Yeah, there's 
those different ways of giving creatively are, you know, you can get so much more leverage out of the payment of that gift and that support of, of the hospital on the donor side. And of course the hospital benefits. And that is of course, wonderful. Also, what are you seeing um, that's popular around giving now? Anything unique or different in the real estate space or outside of it? We're working with with realtors now, which is an interesting twist where realtors really want to be more than just somebody who helps buy and sell homes, but they want to be a trusted advisor to their to the people who they helped to buy. And so we've, we're seeing more realtors who are expressing interest in how can I help my client and be more of a trusted advisor long term to them than just transactional. And so we're doing a lot of education in that space on how they can help their their clients learn more about how to use real estate for charitable giving. So that's kind of an exciting twist that that we're partnering with those, that real estate community. Wonderful. I love it. That's uh, It's certainly new and different, and I look forward to hearing more about how that education is going. So uh, especially with home prices being so high right now, and like you said, having so much appreciation, you know, the timing of our conversation is perfect. And many of the transactions that you highlighted today are, are perfect for real estate owners to utilize their assets to support our community. And Wendy, I really want to thank you so much for joining us today. And if uh, if you're in Wendy's backyard and want to get in touch with her, please reach out to me at Centora and I'd be happy to get you all connected. So thank you so much for joining us today, Wendy. Really appreciate it. My pleasure. And thank you for giving me an opportunity to uh, to share how people can really support the charities that they care about. Wendy and Dana, this was, has been a fantastic podcast. Wendy, I could hear your heart in in the things that you were sharing, uh, that you how you work with clients. It was fantastic. Dana, of course, thank you so much for bringing her on the show. And our last thank you always goes to you, the listening audience. Thank you so much for tuning in and listening to the Live Life Liberated podcast with the team from Centura Wealth Advisory. If you have not subscribed to the podcast yet, please click the subscribe now button below. This way, when they come out with a new podcast, it'll show up directly on your listening device. This makes it much easier to share these podcasts with your friends and family. Again, thank you for listening today. For everyone at Centura Wealth Advisory, this is Eric Johnson reminding you to live your best day every day, and we'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to the Live Life Liberated podcast. Click the subscribe button below to be notified when new episodes become available. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guest and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of Centura Wealth Advisory. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional investing advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service provider with any questions you may have regarding your investment planning. Centura Wealth Advisory, Centura, is an SEC registered investment advisor with its principal place of business in San Diego, California. Centura and its representatives are in compliance with the current registration and notice filing requirements imposed on SEC registered investment advisors, in which Centura maintains clients. Centura may only transact business in those states in which it is notice filed or qualifies for an exemption or exclusion from notice filing requirements. Past performance is no guarantee of future results. Tax relief varies based on client circumstances and all clients do not achieve the same results. 